There are so many good ways to use Sandevistons in Cyberpunk 2077 now, ensuring a more steady and accurate aim, escaping tight situations without getting shot in the back, or using way more attacks in a small space of time than you ever otherwise could. For this video though, I have tested a huge variety of Sandeviston based builds to finally construct what I believe to be the most dangerous, most terrifyingly powerful and effective Sandeviston build you could ever possibly make. I'm talking infinite use, practically no cooldown whatsoever, as well as an exceptionally fast attack speed which serves to continually replenish our health, stamina and Sandeviston usage. With this build on very hard difficulty, I was able to defeat Maxtac, the Border Patrol Guard and Don't Fear the Reaper Adam Smasher with relative ease. And it's not too complicated to get working effectively either, with the fundamental basics alone already taking the build to about 80% of its power. So sit back, relax and when I'm done, you too will be utterly unstoppable. Unstoppable. So this whole build is fairly holistic. Every part, just about, connects, feeds into and synergizes with something else from perks, cyberware and weapons. And outside of the core fundamentals, there's a decent amount of variance to suit your preferred style of play. I'm going to of course give you the best possible combination of things, but also highlight the absolute must-haves for it to work. For attributes then, the best possible combo is 20 reflexes and 20 tech, then at least 15 into body and anything else into cool. Leave intelligence alone as it's entirely unnecessary. This said, if you want to experience multiple builds in one playthrough by respecking perks, this build also works perfectly fine, with a mere 15 in everything. There's no essential level 20 perks, just useful ones. Body then is all about the health buffs, with the painkiller and adrenaline buff nodes bought up of course. This will regen our health and generally make us beefier, and each sub perk directly coming off of those will be relevant too. Offering bonuses you probably won't notice but will definitely appreciate. Into reflexes then, and most of the perks I've chosen here are core fundamentals I would say. Definitely buy up the large primary perks as a matter of urgency if you're earlier on in the game. The build is predominantly katana based, so of course blade perks are crucial. Bullet block is okay, though in sandy time I found myself barely using it. And if you're short on perks, bullet deflects are two you could probably afford to let go. Finishes however are very much needed, especially on very hard in the thick of a fight. Although our sand Everston shouldn't have any cooldown with this, it will still deactivate once its duration is over, leaving a millisecond of vulnerability before we use it again. However, if you toggle the Sandy on and off during a finisher wherein you're invincible, you can reset the Sand Everston in a safe space, shall we say. But for this build to function properly, we need to be killing enemies in quick succession, with dash and air dash of course being a big help with that, darting from enemy to enemy with a stupid degree of speed. Via this combination of dash and blades then, make absolutely sure to get the flash and thunder clap perk as well, since it'll let us leap automatically towards enemies with our katana from about 10 meters off, saving us more crucial time. Also, if you want a cool vehicle ability too, don't forget to grab Stunt Jock to leap out of moving cars directly into fights. If you do have the 20 attributes, then get Slaughterhouse and Tailwind too, which restore stamina for dismemberments and dashes respectively. Though thanks to our cyberware, these buffs are slightly less needed, and I found myself doing fine without them. Tech then, most crucially, is for buffing cyberware, an equally important component to our success with this. Driver updates and chipware connoisseur will add small but helpful little buffs when upgrading our cyberware, with the latter allowing us to choose from three different options, for which you always want to take the one with the highest melee damage, followed by any health boosts and damage reduction. Getting lucky day with this will then allow us to upgrade more quickly. Extended warranty should improve apogee duration, and then if you have the attributes, get edge runner for a bonus 50 cyberware, an occasional active of the Fury State for even greater damage bonuses. Not that we need that bit, but the cyberware, yes. Then, and this bit isn't crucial to the build, you can entirely forego it for an alternative or nothing at all, and definitely only start specking it after everything else, but this tree has a number of extra buffs. Lower ones will boost the effectiveness of our healing items, and are probably the most worth getting for staying alive. But then, also Pyromania and Doom Launcher. I found since Katana far outweighs any of the melee arm cyberware for this build especially, 
actually. The only one actually useful in combat is the projectile launcher. And indeed, since this build is predominantly melee, it was exceptionally useful for any turrets or foes you can't get to, as well as groups a little ways off or in the odd occasion that our sandy charge actually does deplete. The doom launcher perk then buffs the launcher all round, and most importantly provides it one extra charge. Finally, ticking time bomb causes you to detonate an EMP after three seconds every time you activate the sandy, a numerous occurrence for this build which will be pretty useful when amongst larger groups of enemies. Also, whilst charging this thing, you get a massive 50% damage reduction, though can take a small hit when the EMP goes off, serving as a potential hindrance in, say, boss battles. Like in the Smasher fight, for example, it kept going off and docking me 40 health when I was nowhere near him or any other enemies to damage, and I could possibly have done with unequipping it there. But more often than not, it is going to be useful, and with our cyberware, is going to heal more than it takes. If there's any attribute you want to spec 20 into, for definite in fact, then it'd be tech. Now, anything remaining is going to go into cool, since the next best accompaniment after katanas for this build are throwing weapons, with scorpion sting and juggler, respectively, making them poisonous and instantly return after any critical, headshot or poison neutralization. In fact, this entire build can be adapted to be throwing weapon exclusive, working almost as well, save for against the likes of max tack and bosses in general. I'll touch on this again a little later, and the changes you maybe want to make to optimize for that. For now though, they'll merely serve as another ranged backup for when we need them. Then Road Warrior is going to extend our Sandy to work in cars as well. Not crucial to the build necessarily, but can be fun. Finally, we come to the Relic Tree, and a hugely important thing to get here is vulnerability analytics, alongside machine learning. These diamonds of explosive electrical damage, which will then crop up, will be game-changingly brilliant for us, but we'll come to that. After you've done this, then just spec in a jailbreak, and of course, launch capacity override. Again, for the projectile launcher. On to Cyberware, and I'm going to go through this in order of most to least important. So first up, we of course have the Centerpiece, best San Deviston in the game used by David Martinez himself, the Militech Apogee, and you want to upgrade this too as a matter of priority, decreasing its cooldown whilst increasing its damage stats. The Militech Falcon is a working alternative, though the Apogee is just going to suit our purposes so much better, slowing time to 85% with an 8 to 10 second duration and 25 second cooldown at tier 5. Plus plus. Of course, with a lot of cyber magic and a tint of skill, we're going to make that cooldown entirely disappear, though the lower it is to begin with, the easier that's going to be. And since this will be primarily achieved with katanaing, preserving and restoring stamina is a key note of importance here. Thankfully, this sandy buffs both its own duration and our stamina on each neutralization whilst it's active. To make it go even further though, get used to deactivating it at moments when you're traversing from foe to foe. In the middle of a huge group, you should be fine. That's enough enough harvestable souls around you to keep it going, but out in the open, alone, you're wasting charge if not under fire. So switch it off, even if just for a millisecond, as it'll go further, but also importantly, reset the usage at a time that suits you. Now let's take this power even further. Axolotl is acquirable very early in the game, as a reward for completing all of Regina's gigs in Watson, or else you can buy it from Ripadox in Dogtown. This one restores an additional 12.5% cooldown fully upgraded to any cyberware, not just San Deviston's. Though debatably, the cyberware capacity cost might be a little too much in this build given we're using no other cyberware with a cooldown. I did test out initially combining this time slow stuff with the likes of Revolsa, Korenzikov and Synaptic Accelerator for the ultimate slow time build, as it were, but soon found out it was way too overcomplicated, trying to balance what was slowing time when it, it just made more sense to simplify it down to the San Deviston only. I also tried the Quantum Tuner for an extra San Deviston in charge at the start of a fight, but it was too costly in cyberware and not economical in the larger, tougher fights. It just wasn't needed. Besides, you can only get that via one Phantom Liberty ending anyway. But back to Axolotl, and you could debatably just use the Newton module, instead only restoring 1.35% for every neutralization. That's barely anything, sure, but remember the Sandy itself already gives 20% duration per kill. Personally though, I did notice a difference not having the Axolotl here, and did 
did run out of Sandy Charge on a few occasions, thanks to not enough kills in quick succession. That said, in this instance, the bonus cyberware allowed me to buy Chitin, for a huge health and armor buff, allowing me to survive where I otherwise wouldn't in real time. Basically, for the promise of infinite Sandy, go Axolotl, but if you want a higher survival rate in the event of ducking out of the fight for a second, go Chitin. The two next most important things are Dense Marrow and Adrenaline Booster, the first of which improves melee damage by up to 27% at the expense of 15% more stamina. That drawback will then mostly be mitigated by Adrenaline Booster, restoring a further 25% stamina with every kill and keeping our Lightning Flurry going. Heal on kill then will do much the same sort of thing, only with health instead, and Biomonitor will mean we don't have to worry about manual heals at all if we ever get too low. You could switch this out for Blood Pump, that'll give you better healing overall, but then you'd have to manually keep an eye on and activate it yourself. Now this build isn't lazy, you do have to focus still, and personally I prefer the ease of removing this distraction. The rest is all about bonus damage and defense. Stabber is going to improve our crit chance by a nice 20% both with the blades and throwables, then for armor, proxy shield, or if you have the cyberware, peripheral inverse, will reduce all damage from nearby enemies, which when we're darting around and are always in close range of someone will be useful for the odd time they land hits, and when they do, shock and all will hit them right back 10% of the time for a huge 500 damage. Particularly great in a tight spot, but if you want more protection and less flare, then go for say Pain Editor or Pain Deucer. Skeleton isn't too specific after Dense Marrow, I had room for Bionic Joints and Epimorphic Skeleton, though if you can, switch out the joints for Parabellum, a huge buff to armor overall. Reinforced Tendons can give you the most maneuverability in legs, but this one can be whatever you want. Eyes is all or nothing, either take the basic Kuroshis, or if you found a lot of Cyberware Shards, then the Cockatrice Eyes, for again a higher crit chance and overall improved damage. And of course, as I already explained, Projectile Launcher. Finally, for those wanting to use more throwing weapons, Handle Wrap from Hands is going to help with this when you first equip them. A priority if you're using the alternative style that I'll get to, but if not, just an as and when you can afford it kind of deal. Now for the creme de la creme of this build, a centerpiece arguably more important than the Sandeviston itself, which can hold its own even with time moving at 100% speed. Getting this weapon is pretty simple, just head to Japantown and complete all of the 8 gigs for Wakako. And if you want a greater appreciation for the nuance and interconnectedness of the story details behind these, then stick my Westbrook gigs video on in the background, where I piece all of that together. But after doing this, Wakako will gift you Biako, arguably the most powerful katana in the game, a detail which shines even more true when time is slowed. See, by leaping towards an enemy, then killing them, you'll activate rapid combo mode, allowing you to swing this katana deathly fast, dispatching all other foes with extreme ease. As you do this, thanks to our perks and more so cyberware, stamina and health will continue to regen the more foes you dispatch. And under 85% time slow, with the ability to instantly leap and then slice at ridiculous speeds even for what we can see, this is literally the craziest thing I've discovered in 2.0. The speed at which we must be doing this in real time, I doubt is perceptible. But what makes this even better is vulnerability analytics. As you swing at these helpless time frozen people, you want to be aiming for these as much as you can. Not only are they going to harm the enemy in question, they'll also explode their cyberware for yet another EMP blast on top of our shock and awe and possibly ticking time bomb. This is particularly good for the mech enemies, who are still kind of spongy even with our speedy katana swings, but setting off one of these specifically will more often than not blow them up. Also bosses, targeting these on Adam Smasher probably cut that fight in half. Just bear in mind you might have to move around the enemy to keep a direct line of sight of the vulnerability diamond. But with the way Biako works, there are a few things to consider. It's basically a possessed demon sword which only brings out its special power after being fed with souls, though robots will do that too. Without first killing an enemy though, it's going to be just a regular katana. So with this in mind, when faced with a group of enemies, always take out the weakest one first. Target something strong and there is a high chance that the Sand Everston can wear off before you've actually dealt with them. And then we're in trouble. See, whilst this is a pretty much limitless closed feedback loop we've constructed here, it is still a careful balance of death soul magic. Use the Sandy too long without feeding this system and its duration will deplete, as will our health, stamina and Biako's special ability. The endless 
endless, unbreakable loop essentially will fall apart and collapse. Speaking of endless loops, go watch Bodies on Netflix, it's really freaking good. That's not a sponsor by the way, it's just a show I really liked and want to share. Anyway, this ideally works in fights with more enemies then, and the only place I'd say it could fall short is in the longer lone boss fights. I did defeat Smasher with it, along with all of Don't Fear the Reaper on Very Hard. It wasn't a breeze, but it was very doable. Though arguably, for Smasher, I could have done with switching to the scalpel, say, and getting bonus crits for that fight, since there was no way of activating Biako's speed until the snipers came along. And in fact, when fighting Max Tack, because they don't immediately die, the loop starts to collapse when fighting them alone. So it can be worth in that case jumping away and taking out weaker law enforcement alongside Max Tack. Border Patrol soldiers, on the other hand, were individually very easy with this, though the turrets in that area did serve as a great example for why to have projectile launcher and throwing weapons. In fact, turrets are the only time with this build you might need to find cover. Once all of the human enemies were gone and the feedback loop circuit was no longer sustainable, I did have to resort to this slightly less dignified classic style of play. Mind you, by taking Agao from the Iozarin boss fight up in Dogtown as your second weapon, turrets get made short work of too, emitting yet another EMP blast for extra damage thrown into a group. And pairing it with the launcher, you can take out like two turrets at least per Sandy use. I know this is a very specific situation I'm talking about now, but this method is good for applying to all unreachable turrets throughout the game in this build. So yeah, with relative ease I did clear the border checkpoint, but sadly the game itself then said nope and forced me to die, somehow. I took Fang as a backup for this version of the build, but need to fully re-rank all the knives before I can give you the definitively best ones. But equally you could take a shotgun, a revolver, or actually a sniper could work very well given it would extend this thing to work at range, but again, don't overcomplicate it. This build went through many iterations until I nailed it down to work this well, and stuff that seems like a good addition at first will more often than not just distract from keeping that all-inclusive feedback loop up and running. So third weapon is up to you, if you even want one. I've used Biako like 98% of the time for this build because that is the core of its ultimate power. That being said, it can be very easily adapted into a throwing weapon build. For this, all you need to do is spec more heavily into cool, get that to at least 15, keep reflexes to a maximum of 15 in this case, then you might as well substitute blade perks for these stealthy ones instead. Throwing knives are of course silent weapons, even the explosive agao it seems, so this does work a lot better for an effortless stealth build, shall we say. By which I mean I was able to clear most of this place in stealth without even really trying to be. And this is actually where the knife knives work best, receiving massive boosts when used from stealth. Definitely get the Vanishing Act perk, which triggers optical camo whenever you sneak sprint, and you can then move around in stealth with even less effort. Insta-kill headshotting most everyone with increased accuracy and speed from time slow, and receiving your weapons back immediately when you do. Of course, there are the odd occasions outside of stealth especially, where juggler won't activate because you won't land a headshot, a crit or poison, and you could run out of weapons on stronger enemies. Hopefully, finish a perks will help mitigate this even more, offering another thing with which to fully restore weapons, but aside from that you still have the projectile launcher to fall back on. Though equally, if you'd rather have something that doesn't also run out in your secondary, you could spec perk points from Doom Launcher and Pyromaniac instead into blunt weapons, and roll with Griller Arms. Or alternatively, get some blade perks back and use the Mantis Blades, but Griller Arms are better, and this video here explains why. As for the rest of the cyberware, as we're no longer really using melee, adrenaline booster can be replaced with blood pump. Second Heart is also an option here, especially for the likes of Don't Fear the Reaper, to avoid death via general bullshit and silliness, though that one does have a pretty hefty cooldown of 3 minutes and 20 seconds, so it's mostly useful when brought down by Axolotl. Dense Marrow can also be replaced with something else, maybe run Parabellum and Epimorphic Skeleton in tandem, and given our attacking from greater range now, Shock and Awe and Proxy Shield can afford to go too. Just make sure to replace them with at least a optical camo, but yeah, that's about all you have to do to turn it into a throwing variant. Like I say, it's more stealthy, more tactical in a sense, still very powerful, but doesn't quite match the utter quicksilver ridiculousness that Biako Apogee Leap Attack Air Dash build does. I really hope I come up with a better name than that before I title this video. Anyway, as a little closing point, yes, Don't Fear the Reaper was relatively straightforward with this build. I didn't complete it first try, I'll admit, or even second, but that's more down to very hard mode having this 
Elden Punk style feature, wherein getting hit with the wrong move by the wrong enemy at the wrong time will drain health so much as to bypass Biomon and instantly kill you. But learning that this giant mech can stomp you in one, or that a heavy gunner is going to blitz your health as soon as you've accessed the mainframe, or even just not to let Adam Smasher get anywhere near you, like ever, were all just lessons that improved my skill as a player, and borrow from that Souls-like concept of you as a person scaling up by learning from your mistakes. And I think if there was a build, or a style of play, wherein any old sod could waltz in here and easily succeed at very hard difficulty on their first try, the game wouldn't be properly balanced. So I like to think this is a sign that it's not a definitively broken build, just a very, very powerful one, albeit dependent on a constant influx of multiple enemies to work at its best. Though in fairness, the individual components are powerful enough to also hold their own anywhere, as proved by how this build can also defeat Adam Smasher. So let me know down below your thoughts on this build. Have you created something similar? Do you think you will now? And most importantly, is there anything you would change to make it arguably even more powerful? Huge thanks, as always, to the patrons for your continued support and keeping the videos free of irrelevant sponsors. More on that in the description. And finally, thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you very soon in another video.